um, and to be able to, to learn how to go out safely into the community and find uh, those places where um, people need help and then report that back to our uh, denomination and our conferences mission uh, programs. So, that's all to say, uh, early response training is in mid-April. I know that's coming up soon, but um, 14th and 15th. 14th and 15th. And in fact, the, the fellow that the Ray had right there, you can recognize he's the only one without uh, a full head of hair on that road. Uh, so, uh, so Ray, Ray is going to um, is is your man, and he is. Uh, tell us a little more about that. Yeah. Um, the conference is picking up the motel room for you and all the meals. Wow. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, we're going to be training on how to properly tar a roof, how to properly spray mold, and also how to use a chainsaw. Oh boy, that's so what they call it. Give me a call. I get the phone number. Or let's say how not to use a chainsaw. Where <laughs> they teach what not to do. What not to do. That's right. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where? Where? In Goldsboro. Goldsboro. And the conference will cover your uh, hotel and movie. Hotel room, all your meals, and these will be friendly, wonderful, dedicated people. Super, super people. Love so, and trench, please. Yes, April. April 14th and 15th. 14th. Men and women, by the way. Yes, absolutely. All, all comers. Okay, um, we are so happy today to have um, Anna Craft as our liturgist. It's our first Sunday in liturgist. So welcome to her. Thank you. 
the last supper, that's part of it. There's um, when Jesus was arrested in the garden. There's the part where Jesus was crucified. Do you remember that part? This week is so full of things. But it begins with the word Hosanna, which means something special because the people needed help so bad. What did the people need help from? We needed help from Jesus. And so the word Hosanna that the people were saying as Jesus went through into Jerusalem means it means save us. Save us. So when we talk about the hallelujahs and the hosannas, we want to remember that the beginning of the week and the end of the week are the things that we remember the most, maybe. But what happens in the middle is the most important thing that ever happened, and that was when Jesus gave his life for you and me. And for that, we want to always say thank you to Jesus, don't we? So let's come together in prayer and say thank you to Jesus. You repeat that to me. Dear God, we love you, and we want to thank you for Jesus, who is the one that we shout. Hosanna! Save us! Jesus, thank you for saving us. Amen!
Here now in Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you to do this, if anything, if any, excuse me, if anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them. And he will send immediately. This took place to fulfill what was that is spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and cut others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you to God. Well, I, uh, I'll make a little confession. Don't worry, it's not that juicy. Um, but it's a little confession, and it's just that, that once in a while, I get sucked in to what I would call the Wikipedia vortex. You know what that is? Or at least, can you, can you imagine? You, you read something on Wikipedia, and you think, well, that's really interesting. That's cool. And then you get down, and there's a link, and you're like, oh, I want to know more about that part. So I'll click that. And you go on, and then you read a little more about it, and the next thing you know, you see something else you want to read, you go on a little deeper and deeper. And so I don't remember how I got into this Wikipedia vortex, but I did about Josephine Baker. Now, I, it's a good thing the projector's not working, because so don't. She was a, um, let's say, Burbette's entertainer of the 1940s, the jazz age, and I, I wasn't going to put a picture of it anyway, but it's a good thing we did. Uh, she's a beautiful woman, but uh, amazing uh, what she did. She was an entertainer who became a spy for the French resistance when the Nazis took over France. She used her celebrity to gain high access to high-ranking Nazi officers. Well, this led me down to learn more about the French resistance. You know, I've seen movies and all that, but I thought, well, let me see what, what that was about. So I read more about her, and then I, before I knew it, I was reading about Hitler entering into Paris on, a, you know, with the whole revenue and ticker tape and all the confetti and all the uh, bands and everything. And I read about how the crowds that I saw in the old newsreels who were standing out there giving the uh, Nazi salute to Hitler were... I, you know, from the from the back from the big picture from the newsreel, you can't really see their faces too much. But some photographer got a picture of a few of them and their faces, and they had tears coming down their faces. Not happy tears, sad tears. And it turns out, I read a little more about it. It turns out the soldiers had gone through the community in the in the neighborhood where this parade was going to happen in, in, the, in downtown and forced people out of their homes to go out and, and you know, I mean, I mean, they, I guess they forced them to go out and welcome Hitler and to do the salute. They, their bodies were doing it, but their hearts weren't into it. In fact, their hearts were breaking. There's this iconic image of this man tears streaming down his face. And he's grieving. Now, why would I bring such a thing on a, on a special day like today? Historians say that there's a long history whenever a conquering general or whatever they want to call themselves you know, comes into town, premier, or prime minister, or whatever, and they come in and, and there's a long history of forcing the people to go out and welcome them. We don't really have a lot to that to around here because thank the Lord we haven't been 
under occupation. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, occupying forces will get those crowds to go out there and praise and get it all excited or act like they're excited about the conquering ones. And I bring all that up because that's what happened in Jerusalem back in the day, a lot of times. A lot of times they would be, uh, say, a king, somebody from Babylon or somebody from Assyria or then later the Romans, you know, and they were going to come into Jerusalem. And each of them kind of took turns, uh, if you will, uh, being in control of Jerusalem. It was a good city to get if you were uh, an empire. And so they would come in, and, and they would force people to go out and welcome the Roman generals with their shiny spears and all, and their big white horses, and, and, and praise them. And they would tell them, go get branches and wave the branches because laurels and that whole thing was a big deal with them. You know? So they'd say, go out there and, and tell the general you know, that you're so glad that they're there because if you don't do that, then they'll lay siege to the city and knock the walls down and come in anyway. You see what I'm saying? So they were always going out there with this real conflict except the time that Jesus rode into town. The time that Jesus rode into town, the people were not forced out at the end of a spear or a sword. They came out to praise Jesus of their own volition because that's what they, they wanted to do. They were so moved by him, they were excited about him, they had heard of him, he had been around the city a few times. And by this point, Matthew, and he was really creating a stir. He was different from those generals and those people that wanted to occupy the city. He came with a new kingdom. So Jesus and the disciples reached the edge of Jerusalem. So back up a little bit in the story. Okay? They're at the Mount of Olives, Bethphage. Jesus sends two disciples ahead and says, there's somebody that's going to have a colt and a donkey tied up. You're going to tell them that you need them. The master needs them. They'll let it go. And they come. And I will ride on them. They went to the village. And it was just like he said. They brought these back. And donkey and a colt, Matthew says. And then he says, Jesus got, they put their cloaks on them. Or something on them. And it says in Matthew. And we have a Campbell the Betty student here. So you'll have to figure this out for me later. Okay. That it says, in the Greek, it really says, he sat on them. So it's okay to chuckle. <laughs> that this was not, this was weird. I don't know how he sat on them. I can't even sit on, get up on one horse. I maybe I could get on the donkey for that help, but you know, without little steps or something. But he sat on them. But then it says that was to fulfill the prophecy that he would come riding in on a colt and the and the fold. The, the, and, and he would, uh, on a donkey and on a colt, the fall of the donkey. So, I don't know, I think Matthew was trying to cross all, check all the boxes, you know. And so he was saying, well, he keep writing it on the down. Just a little thing that the many students and me find funny, but nobody else does. So, <laughs> so here they come riding in, he comes riding in. The king going into Jerusalem. The crowd spreads their cloaks on the ground and their palm branches waving in the air. Maybe they spread these down the branches on the, on, the, on the road too. And the crowd shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Now we've already heard that Hosanna means what? Save us, right? God save us. But blessed is the one who, and when they said Hosanna to the son of David, that was not just code word, that was explicit word for the Messiah. And so they were already claiming him as Messiah right in front of the Pharisees and the scribes and the temple leaders who were in charge of deciding who was Messiah and who was not. So they're already giving him the honorific title, and they don't, you know, the rulers don't like that. Then the other part that he say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is something that was reserved in some form and fashion. Maybe he changed the words around a little bit. But it meant, blessed is the one who comes, they used to say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of Caesar. 
So now these people are out here saying, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Wait a minute. And so the Romans got a little, started shaking in their little sandals. Here they go. Wait a minute. The other people, these others weren't happy to see Jesus. It says the whole city of Jerusalem was in turmoil. And people were asking, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth uh, of Galilee. So now we have the makings of an amazing story. Don't we? We've got our protagonist, Jesus. We've got our antagonist, the temple leaders and officials. Uh, we've got the plot, Jesus riding in to set things straight. And he eventually moves toward his crucifixion. So we have our story. My question to you is, as you got up here this morning, and, and most of you came here willingly, and some of you came because mom or dad said to, or your wife or your husband said to come. But my question to you is, what are you going to do with this story? you got a story. It's your story. It's our story. Whether you realize it or not, whether you've even thought about it or not, whether you just came to see the children lay the branches, that's great, but you've got a story. What are you going to do with the story? Jesus is on the move. He's not sitting peacefully. He's bouncing up and down on the colt or a donkey or both or something. The crowd is making a ruckus. It's so dusty that they put branches on the road. He's already a threat to the political and religious establishment. People's teeth are set on edge. What are you going to do? Because this is your story. I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but let's say, put it this way, Jesus has ridden into your life and is riding into your Easter, into your Beaufort, your North Carolina, our United States, and all the things. Our time and place, our hearts. Are we going to join the protagonists or the antagonists? Matthew says that Jerusalem was in turmoil. And those of you who know me know I'm, yet, I'm kind of a nerd about the Greek stuff but uh, that the New Testament was written in. But in the Greek, the word for turmoil, turmoil that's used there really has the, is the root word that we use for seismic or, or seismological. Or, okay, when you think seismic, what do you think of? Earthquakes, right? So really, turmoil is a pretty weak word. It really means people were shook. They were shook to their core. But we know the full story know that this just, we who know the full story know that this is just the beginning of an earthquake that's going to happen this week. This is just a tremor compared to what's going to happen when Jesus is arrested and tried and crucified. Matthew tells us how Jerusalem was in turmoil back when the Magi came through and asked about this new king of the Jews and that Herod was shaking in his little sandals too. But throughout Matthew, and if you read it from start to finish, I recommend you do this week perhaps, that in Matthew there's this escalating tension between Jesus and the rulers, the Pharisees and the scribes and the, the, the temple authorities. And back and forth they go, chapter after chapter, you know, uh, poking each other, you might say, with 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 uh, provocation, and well, we're going to trap him. Well, then he's going to do this, and then they're going to do that. It's rather it's rather great if you read it in terms of story. And Matthew is the one that says that when Jesus died, a real earthquake shook the area so hard that the temple curtain was torn in two, and the dead even were shaken from their graves. Something else. It's in there. So what are you going to do with this story? Did you know that you were getting yourself into this when you got up this morning and said, well, it's all Sunday. I'm going to go to church. It's almost Easter. Did you know what you were getting yourself into? Did you know that you were going to be an observer or even a participant in welcoming Jesus into the world and into your heart and into Jerusalem and into the cosmos as the Savior? 
Did you kind of go along and think of Jesus as, hey, got a lot of respect for the guy, a great moral teacher, you know, uh, right up there with the other religions and all that? Or did you come expecting to find a Savior? Expecting to find one who is going to save you, saves you not only from your sin, but is here to change the world. Did you think it was just about palm branches? You think we did this whole thing about leaves? Jesus' followers say, save us. Where, think about this, folks, where do you say to the Lord in your life, Lord, save me? Maybe the first time, maybe somebody's never said that, maybe you've never said that before, but let's say you have, many of you have. Where do you still say, Lord, save me. Where are you teetering and tottering and just in the midst of things? Where, where do you need to hear a Hosanna? Where do you need to shout a Hosanna? Family? School? Work? Faith life? Lord, save us. Because this crowd... These folks were your great, 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 and so many great grandparents in the faith. You see, some they told someone, and then they told someone, and they told someone, and like that old shampoo commercial, uh, it all can't seem I remember that one. And then they told someone, and nobody remembers that. I'm showing my age. But they told someone, and told someone, and told someone, until somebody told you. Somebody brought you in on the story. And maybe it happened before today, or maybe it's happening right now for somebody. Maybe right now you are finding yourself in the story. Maybe you're finding yourself in the crowd. Heaven forbid you're finding yourself among the religious rulers and you know, looking down your nose and all this stuff. I don't know play guitar at church today. You know? Maybe you're that. No. Maybe you're just observing from like 5,000 feet over. But I want to invite you into this story. Because Jesus has come to, into your life and experience. Into your heart. Not just thousands of years ago, but right now. Have you joined in with them? Are you watching from a safe distance? Or are you right up in the action with them? Have you been journeying with Jesus and finally reached Jerusalem? Stay with him, sisters and brothers. Stay with him. Most of his disciples didn't even stay through the whole thing. But you can be right there. Flank him and jump for joy because he has come to Jerusalem for the Passover. The Jesus movement has reached the big time. This is happening now. You're here not just to watch the children wave branches and not just to wave branches yourself, but to incorporate this story into your life. And I know that even if you don't know what that looks like today, and I'm up here saying, well, what's the story going to do for you? And like, I don't know. Guess what? God knows. God knows. Be on the lookout for this story in your life this week. Be on the lookout for Jesus riding into your life and heart and experience. Praise Him. Give Him glory. Hosanna to the King of Kings. For He can hear you. And your praise is music to His ears today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Alfred. Would you please stand for a little response? No, we can say we stand for one or the other. Tell me the story of the two.
time to pray together. There's so much to pray about in this world and in this time. I want to lift up to you uh, Jason Watson uh, uh, and uh, Karen's son, uh, Karen Willis' son. And uh, he is uh, in the hospital again and in need of a great amount of prayer and support. And Jerry Hardesty Jr. Uh, is at home, but hospice is uh, with him. And, and uh, things have really uh, accelerated in this, in this uh, disease. So uh, if you will remember him and his family this week, uh, that's very important. Uh, we apologize to the uh, Facebook viewers, uh, but uh, one of the we are streaming out, but we don't have uh, uh, ready handy access to your prayer concerns so that you are typing into the comment box. But just know that uh, I'll invite all of us to go back to and pull this service up and see what those are and pray about them. So and pray for those folks today. So a bit of that technical stuff that we're dealing with. Uh, but nevertheless, we are praying for you, uh, for those of you watching and entering your prayer concerns, and we will pray for them. Sterling Hudson lifts up uh, his aunt Stephanie Braswell beginning her 96th year. Congratulations. Please send our best. And Lady Bridges um, over here uh, mentions Tammy, uh, one of uh, her friends in class at the college. And uh, she needs a lot of prayer. She has some serious health issues. So we'll join you in praying for her. Right. Hopefully it's going to be okay. So these and many more are printed in your bulletin. They'll be online. And, uh, and, and you know the best thing is, Jesus, as I said, Jesus hears you. He hears you as you pray. So we will have a moment of uh, musical reflection in which you can prepare your heart, but also lift up that person or persons or situations. Uh, it could be everything from, uh, from all that we're going through as, as a nation or trouble of Ukraine, it could be anything like that. Or it could be just your neighbor or your spouse or yourself. Maybe you have a prayer that, that uh, that's too deep for words and you just want to lift it up to God and it's time to do so. Dare we even mention? 
ascension and being amazed by the resurrection. Lord, be with us this very holy week. May it be different for each of us this year. And may we remember that it is about your entry into our hearts and world and your salvation there too. We lift up these that we have mentioned today. We know that there are needs among the people more than we could ever count. But you know all of them. You see all of them. You hear all of them. You know us each by name and you know what our needs are. Be with these and the others that we are raising to you today. Lord, we thank you that the children have witnessed to us and given to us the gift of their faith, of their acceptance that this is not just a story, a story book, but this is about a relationship with you. You who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite those joining our church today to come join me at the prayer. And congregational, you turn to page 33. 33. Two more questions. 
As members of Christ Universal Church, will you continue to be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all that power strengthen us in Jesus? And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you to Christian love. As we live together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. That in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Blaine and Travis, the God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory, establish and strengthen you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, which you may live in grace and peace. Welcome and amen. So let's give them a welcome. Amen.
sails to you, or furtherance of your kingdom in this world, with joy and gladness we pray. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.